What's up, Diversity Church? How's everybody doing this morning? Come on, you guys can do better than that. How's everybody doing this morning? Hey, you guys realize that today is March 1st. Come on, spring is right around the corner. Who's excited about some spring? Today we're going to get a touch of it, a feel of it. 60 degree weather outside. I'm excited about that. And I'm excited about what God's doing in this place. My name is Pastor Jonathan Ember. For those of you guys who may not know, I'm the lead and founding pastor of Diversity Church. And we just wanted to welcome those who are in the building today. And can you give those who are watching at our North Campus and online a great round of applause as well, man. Love you guys. Thanks for uh, tuning in each week, and maybe if you're not here, you can always watch us live if you uh, miss a Sunday, or again, at our North Campus, we broadcast the message about three times a month up there, and then Pastor Mike is actually going to be preaching next week up there, and so I know you guys are excited about that. We just want to welcome those this morning uh, again, and then I'm excited about preaching the next message in Born Identity. Who's been excited about this series, man? You guys been getting some things out of it? So far in this series, we've just been talking about who we really are when we're born again. Like when we get saved, what does it mean to be a Christian? What is the identity that we now have as a born again believer? What is that? Because what we've been discovering in this series is our being determines our doing. Our doing actually comes out of who we really think we are, who we really are and when we discover that. And so we've been talking about things like we are valued and we're thought about and we're unconditionally accepted, that we're seated with Christ in heavenly places, like we have a new position, right? We're clothed in his righteousness. We've been talking about all sorts of aspects of our new identity, and I just want to preach on this further with a message called, I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. Everybody say, we're going deep. Are you guys going to do that with me? I said, everybody say, we are going deep. I like that. There you guys. I need to do a little something to get you with me, all right? Uh, we're going to be a little bit deeper today. I, I actually thought about having Nina sing um, the, that song, I'm off the deep end, watch as we... You guys know that song? She would sing it better than I do. Um, anyway, we're going to go deep today. We're talking about being the temple of the Holy Spirit. When I was in Brazil traveling with a man named Dr. Suarez, uh, we were in the car one day as we were going to the next place we were going to preach and, and minister to the people of Brazil, and he began to tell me about this story of the city who was at one point stuck in severe poverty. Uh, they didn't have much work going on in that city, so they couldn't provide for their families uh, food or clothing, and I mean, they were just really, really impoverished. And one day, this man from Europe comes, and he begins to excavate the land that was right beneath them, and what he had come to find out was while this city was stuck in poverty underneath them were all sorts of riches. So he excavated the land, he found jewels and all sorts of precious stones. And I thought that was amazing. And the parallel between Christians and what this story really tells is, is a pretty amazing revelation that when we get born again, we have some riches on the inside of us. We have some things that are deep, deep, deep inside, some riches, some glory, some power, some, some, some amazing things. But unfortunately, many times we're like that town in Brazil. We're acting poor even though we're rich. We, we believe that we're in poverty while underneath the surface, there are all sorts of riches. And one of those things that we have inside is the Holy Spirit. We're talking about God. There's nothing more rich or more valuable than that. Today, I'm going to be like that excavator, right? I'm going to come in for your identity. I'm going to dig up inside of you, and I'm hoping that you're going to discover the riches of the glory, of the mystery that is inside of us, which Colossians 1.27 says, is Christ in us the hope of glory. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, the, the non-Jews, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. When you are born again, one of your identities, a part of who you really are, and this is maybe the main part of who you really are, is you are filled with God's spirit. You have riches and glory on the inside of you. Paul says it like this in another verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to actually read two verses, 19 and 20. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. And this is where we get the title of the message today. He says, what? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? 
All right, check this out. The reason why he says this at the beginning, he says, do you not know many people are like that town? They don't know what's underneath their surface. When they look in the mirror, when we look in the mirror many times, we're just focused on all the things that we don't like. Today, I need somebody to get their mind off of what you don't like to what is the most glorious thing that has ever existed. God dwelling inside of man, the Holy Spirit who is in you whom you have from God. You are not your own for you are bought with the price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Listen to me. This is some powerful, powerful stuff. And I just want to explore the power of this and the riches of this, the glory of this by telling you three things that this means. Three things that it means to be the temple of the Holy Spirit as we're in this journey of discovering our identity. The very first thing it means is that I'm not who I was. How many of you guys are thankful for that? I am not who I was. Here in 1 Corinthians, really the context of this, we're gonna explore the context, not just verses 19 and 20. We're gonna really explore what Paul was really trying to get these people to believe because again, he wanted their doing to reflect their being. And so this is why he was trying to get them to understand their identity. And he goes in and I'm gonna read two verses before what we had read in verse 9 and 11 of 1 Corinthians Again, 1 Corinthians 6, let's look at verses 9 and 11. He's helping them discover their identity by telling them who they once were and then showing them they're not that anymore. Look at this. He says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? He's beginning to now mention, he's about to mention a bunch of people who uh, are sinners, people that are separated from God, people that are on their way to hell, if you will. And so this is what he's saying. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? This is the unrighteous. This is the identity of people that are unrighteous. He says, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, as sexually immoral people, nor idolaters, people that worship other other gods, nor adulterers, people that have sex outside uh, or with somebody else's spouse, homosexuals, nor sodomites. Look, he continues to, again, name certain uh, people apart from Christ, apart from their identity in Christ, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, uh (laughs) uh-oh, nor revilers, Uh, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. So he just named a bunch of people, again, that have their identity in the things that they do, okay? People that are separated from God, all right? Sinners. Now he says this in verse 11, such were some of you. Did you guys notice that? He says such were, meaning you aren't these things anymore. When you're born again, You you say, God, I want you more than my sin. Doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect. Matter of fact, some people that are listening to me right now might even relate to some of the things that he just mentioned. But if you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, now you are not that thing anymore. Come on, somebody. Are you with me today? He says, you were, such were some of you, but now you were washed. The King James says, you are washed. (laughs) This is who you are now, washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That same blood that the Bible says he bought us with in verse 20 that we read. We are now washed. We're made clean. You might even fail again, but guess what? You are washed. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. You are washed. But you were, again, King James says, you are sanctified. You know what this word comes from? We use the word saint many times. So like, you know, Saint Mother Teresa or St. John, or St. Peter, or St. Mary. And we think that's like for those holy, holy people. What you're gonna discover in this message as well is that means you. It says you were set apart. You were sanctified. This is your new identity. You weren't, you are not those things anymore. Maybe the things that you used to run to, the things you used to relate to, the things you used to live in. You aren't those things anymore because you are washed. You are sanctified, and it says you are justified, meaning just as if I've never sinned. The way that God looks at me, my identity is just as if I never sinned. Talk about confidence. Talk about identity. When you can walk around again, we've been talking about this whole series, unashamed. I don't have anything to be ashamed of. Why? Because my sins are washed. I am righteous. I'm sanctified. I'm holy. God looks at me, and he says, man, that's a holy man. That's Miguel. He's holy. (laughs) I'm justified just as if I've never sinned. I'm righteous before God. When he looks at me, he sees his son, Jesus. He doesn't see again that adulterer, that fornicator, 
that homosexual, that thief, whoever that person was. No, he actually sees you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord. And look, by his spirit and by the spirit of our God. Church, when you're born again, you are not who you were. You're something so much more. You have literally been set apart and your body now, what we've discovered later on, he, he expounds on it. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Come on, this is something really special. When the Holy Spirit comes to dwell somewhere, it will never be marked by what it used to be. Have you guys ever been to James Wickham Riley's house in um, Greenfield? Anybody ever been to that house? When we were in elementary school, I remember actually going and touring that as like a field trip. How many guys loved field trips when you were a kid, man? Like it was like the best thing on earth, right? I didn't care about maybe James Wickham Riley or whatever, man. I just was excited to get out to school and go somewhere and have some fun for the day. And so we go to James Wickham, Wickham's Riley's house. I think I said that right. I might not have. My wife will always correct me after the service. Um, we go to the house, and this house has been marked by a famous person who once lived there. Now, I don't know who used to live there or who resided in that house before. All I know is after this famous person who wrote all sorts of amazing poetry had lived there, now this place has been marked and is forever changed by, by everybody viewing the identity of this house as the house where James Wickham Riley had lived. Today, I'm telling you guys, you are forever marked and forever changed by somebody who dwells in your house. What the temple literally of the Holy Spirit means is the house of God. What you are right now is the house of the living God. Let me tell you, that trumps every single thing else that you ever used to be or ever were or what you even think you are right now. You are the house of God. Come on, somebody needs to get excited in the church today that you house the presence of God. Being in the temple of the Holy Spirit trumps anything else that you ever were. I want you to recognize that forever. I want you to look at yourself, not as just something ordinary, not something that you once were, not something maybe even others view you as. I want you to begin to live out your identity and awaken to your identity of who you really are. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Some of us identify maybe as I was describing some of those things in this verse, maybe some of you guys still identify as those things. Uh, matter of fact, our whole our journey of uh, discovering Jesus and, and finding Jesus, uh, the Bible says we behold his glory and we're transformed from glory to glory to glory. And so maybe you, you still, even as a Christian, still identify as these things. I'm telling you, the more you find Jesus, the more you excavate Jesus and his spirit on the inside of you, the more, again, you will start to understand, I am not those things. I am something far more special. Our whole world is all about identity right now. Matter of fact, the world uh, talks about sexual identity and gender identity and everything in our culture has been just consumed with identity because, again, people don't know who we are. And, and, and if we don't know who we are, again, our doing comes out of our being. And I wonder why we're kind of just all over the place and, and we don't have much security. Uh, I want you to recognize that in this series, what we're trying to give you is your supreme identity. Uh, there are things that you can even relate to that aren't even bad, aren't even like sins, like what 1 Corinthians 6 talks about. There are other things that you might relate to as, hey, I'm a man, or I'm a woman, or I'm black, or I'm white. And, and you even relate to your race, or even uh, in Bible days, there were people that were enslaved. And so people said, you know, I'm a slave person. Other people said, I'm a free person. And they took their identity in all these things. Paul takes it such to the great degree of trying to help us understand who we are in Christ that in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, look at what Galatians 3, 28 says. It says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. Meaning Jew or the Greek, you can say black or white or whoever else. There is neither slave nor free person. There is neither even male or female for you are all one in Christ. So you might even be those things and relate to those things and even identify as those things even. But what he's trying to get us to understand is that there is something deeper than those things. 
that your whole being and doing should be coming out of. And it's the fact that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if I have Christ in me, I can have Christ outside of me. If I have the Holy Spirit in me, I can actually now begin to operate in the fruit of the Holy Spirit on the outside of me. I don't need to just relate into the things that are outward, that, that whole town that we open up the message with. They were relating on just the things on their outward sign. Uh, they were poor and they acted poor as a result of it. They, they had all that. But underneath the surface, y'all, there was something so much greater. And I'm here to provoke and help awaken somebody to recognize that underneath the surface, there is something greater. You've been marked by the Holy Spirit. You are the house of the living God. And it's, it's about time for the church to awaken to that and start living out that identity as being the temple of the Holy Spirit and not anything else that you ever were. Nothing else that you ever were is more important than that, all right? So the very first thing that this means, being the temple of the Holy Spirit, it means that you aren't who you were. The second thing it means is I'm holy. I am holy, sanctified. What holy means is to be set apart or different. Now, some of you guys, I didn't need to tell you you were different for you to realize that. <laughs> John Schmitz is shaking his head. He was like, yeah, I already know, yeah, yeah. Um, but what that means is different even from the world. Uh, different as in like I'm set apart. There's something different about me. Kind of like the temple, right? So when this is talking about the temple of the Holy Spirit, in the Old Testament, there was a physical temple. It first started in uh, the wilderness when the people of Israel left um, Egypt, and they went through the Red Sea, kind of what we were singing about here this morning, and they went into uh, the desert. They set up this, this tent, this temple, this temporary temple, and this place housed the presence of the living God, okay? In the Holy of Holies, this, this temple was made up of three parts. This temple, or the, even the tabernacle, again, in the Old Testament, it was made up of the outer courts, this is where they would sacrifice and do all sorts of things for the people of Israel to wash away their sins and to remind them uh, of all those type of things. And then it goes into the holy place where only the priest could go. This was a very holy place because only priests could enter into the holy place or the inner courts. And then there was a holy of holies in this temple or this tabernacle. And in this holy of holies, uh, the priest would only be able to go in once a year and he would put the blood uh, on the Ark of the Covenant and it would be a symbol that the whole people of Israel once a year was washed and cleansed of their sins. And he could only do this once a year. And this is where the Ark of the Covenant was, where the, the two uh, Ten Commandment tablets were. And then there was the, the manna from heaven. There was some of that in there, and Aaron's rod. And this was just a, a glorious holy place that the Bible says that God's presence had dwelt. It's a very holy place. Matter of fact, it's so holy to the people of Israel. And even once they built the, the actual real one, uh, the one that was not just temporary, but was permanent, it was so holy that they actually called it the most holy, the holiest of holies, the, the deepest part of that was the most holy place like that could ever be. Like that was so set apart and so different. And this is what the Bible is saying of you. You are so set apart. You are so holy because now you have the holy of holies inside of you. Come on, we're trying to awaken to our identity. In church, we get this backwards so many times. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, the whole idea is trying to get people to awaken to their identity. He's actually telling them, uh, the people of Corinth were so messed up in their sinful nature and so messed up in sexual sin, like they were doing all sorts of just depravity when it came to sexual acts. I mean, just some weird and crazy things. He mentioned in the previous chapter, like one of you guys are sleeping with your dad's wife, like some messed up stuff, right? And so he's talking about this. And instead of trying to get them to change their behavior by saying, do not do this, do not do this, do not do this, like much of the church does, like much of the religion of the world, most religion just is all about do's and don'ts. What he does is tries to wake and awaken them to their identity. What he does is something different. In the church, we're notorious for just trying to get people to change their outside while we neglect what's going on on the inside. 
We focus more on the outside and what they are on the outside versus what they are on the inside. The way that Paul ends up convincing these people of how they should live is he's telling them who they really are. Church, I want you to get this. Most religions talking about don't get tattoos. <laughs> you know, don't, don't wear these type of clothes. Uh, don't go to these movies. You gotta be separate. You gotta be holy. You gotta be different from the world. And they just focus on these outward behaviors. Um, I, and my, my wife growing up, she went to a church that like, hated dancing. Like they just felt like dancing was like the worst thing. Like they believe that um, premarital sex led to dancing <laughs> instead of dancing leading to premarital sex, right? Like, like that's how for real they were on the outward appearance of dancing. Like you just could not dance. God forbid you actually dance in the holy place. By the way, what I'm talking about in this, we all the time are looking for a holy place. Like we got, this is the sanctuary. This is, this is where God's presence dwells, like inside of a church. Guys, you are the church. <laughs> you are God's sanctuary. I am the church. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're all the time going and trying to go to the Holy Land. And one day I want to go to the Holy Land in Israel. Jesus walked there. Jesus walks in me. <laughs> like, like this is, I am holy, right? All right, I digress, okay? But the church is all about these type of things, man. Just outward appearance, trying to get people to change their outward behavior while they neglect the most important thing, the inside of a person's heart. If you've truly been born again, the way that Paul is convincing the church to change their behavior is he's trying to get them to understand who they really are. He says, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine if somebody just took in a prostitute to the actual temple or tabernacle and went to the Holy of Holies? By the way, they would have dropped dead probably. Somebody touched the Ark of the Covenant wrong in the Old Testament and they died right there on the spot. But can you imagine somebody taking in, you know, prostitutes to the Holy of Holies and having sex with them right there in God's house? We're like, oh no, that's the Holy Place. We would never do that. I'm actually surprised at how some people actually treat the church. Because when I was a youngin, <laughs> I would have never done the bad things at a church's parking lot. Like somebody stole not too long ago, our cigarette butt holder. And you know you're going to hell, man. Come on, somebody. <laughs> like, you stole a cigarette butt holder from a church. And you know you are, you are wrong and you are gone, right? Look, what people are willing to do, generally, they're not willing to do stuff. I wasn't even bold enough like that when I was in my worst of days, when I related to some of those things that he mentioned and previously in that chapter, I would have never done it on the church's parking lot. But what he's trying to tell us, Paul is, is that we are the church's parking lot. <laughs> we are the Holy Spirit's parking lot. We, we literally house the presence of God. And that's what he's saying. Would you take this into the temple? Would you allow the temple to be defiled by these things? I don't need to tell you a bunch of do's and don'ts. All I have to tell you is you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. All my mom needed to tell me is that she had nice china inside of her dining room. And, and like, this is, a, this is a set apart place. And I knew I shouldn't be playing around in there. You know, I shouldn't have been wrestling around in there. Jesus took this same thought process to try to change the behavior of people in the temple of his day. I'm going to read in John chapter two, but in order to change these people's behavior in the temple, because they were selling, you know, doves and, and it was just making this place a, a place of just like, you know, people uh, making money and that type of thing. And this was at the temple. This was actually in the temple in Israel. And so in John two sixteen, in order to get them to change their behavior, he tried to tell them the identity, the ID of the temple. And here's the ID of the temple in Jesus's day. In John 2, 16, it says, and he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. And this is after he flipped over the money changers tables and all of those type of things. He says, do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. In order to change their behavior, he showed them the ID, the identification of the temple. Sometimes we lose the sanctity of what really, really matters in life. 
And sometimes we just lose how special we really are. Because people have told us all along the way that we're not special. We're not different. We're not set apart. We're not that great basketball player, that great artist, or that great singer, that great musician, or whoever else. And so we we were not that billionaire. We barely have a thousand. We're barely a thousandaire. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, we we're not those people, right? And so we don't think we're that different. And so we lose it sometimes. What what this message and what this series is about is helping you understand that you really are. You really are that different. You really are that special. You really are that holy. And this begs the question then, if this is who we are, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit and Jesus was upset with with people that was defiling the identification of the temple of his day, that begs the question, what are we allowing in our temples that shouldn't be here? What what is Jesus wanting to do? What, What are those places inside of our lives that need to be turned over? What are some of those places in our lives that he's wanting to come in and say, this is the Father's house. This is the place of, of the holy of holies. This is, this is the place that is so set apart, that is so different. That This is actually the witness to the world of who I am and what I've come to do. What are you allowing into the temple that shouldn't be here? What, what are you allowing inside of this place or maybe outside of this place that shouldn't be there? I don't need to tell you the do's and don'ts. I just need to tell you that. And I want you to really think of it. If you want to do it in the temple, if you want to do it in the church, you probably shouldn't be doing it (laughs) because you are the church. If you want to go to the holy place and go to the temple mount right now and do that same thing, you shouldn't do it now because you're the temple. This is your identity. This is who you really are. You are Holy, And here's the last thing that I want to say that this means. Being the temple of the Holy Spirit means that I am powerful. I am powerful. The Old Testament gives so many powerful examples of the glory of God that actually descended on that Old Testament temple. Whether it was the tabernacle or whether it was the permanent structure of the temple, the, the tent that was the first place where God dwelled in the Holy of Holies or the actual temple where they built it. Solomon was the first one to do that. But the scripture in Exodus 40, this is after they built this temporary structure, this tent, but it was the temple as well because the temple means, again, or the tabernacle means God's dwelling place. But in Exodus 40, 34 through 35, I want you to see the power that is right here in this first temple. It says, then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting. Again, that's that temporary temple. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. I want you to think about the glory of God. Just imagine his power, his brilliance, his light. Uh, The Jewish people, they actually call, it's not in the Bible, but they call this word, this type of glory, the Shekinah glory, which is like the manifest presence of God. The glory of God revealed to us with, with the naked eye that we can actually see it and feel it and touch it. By the way, if he does this too much, this is what happens. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting. He wasn't even able to go into the temple because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. It was such a powerful moment that Moses couldn't even enter in because it was that much glory that much power. The scripture even says that no man has seen the face of God and has lived. Like we're talking about that type of power. And what I'm telling you in this message is that's inside of you. The mystery of the riches of the glory. Christ in you. The hope of glory. Like this is what's on the inside. And, and in order to really get into this and really manifest it, we, we got to dig. I'm, I'm helping us discover it like the excavator, man. We're, we're going deeper to, to get these jewels and to get these riches. Because when we understand that's who we are, we begin to manifest who we are. We are powerful on the inside. Uh, I love this scripture in the New Testament. In Matthew 27, and this is after Jesus cries out, He says, you know, uh, take my spirit, right? He he dies on the cross. Jesus cried out again, loud voice, yielded up his spirit. And then behold, 
the veil of the temple. Now this veil that this is talking about is the veil that separated the holy place to the most holy place. The holy place where only the priest could go in to the actual most holy where they can only go in once a year where the actual uh, Ark of the Covenant was. It says that curtain that separated those two, it was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. The reason why that happened is because the glory of God was leaving that one holy place to come to enter in to all of our holy place. That same rock-shaking, rock-splitting, earthquaking power that was once in the, the glory of God that entered into the tabernacle now is in you. Doesn't Romans 8, verse 11, Jeremy Camp has a song about this, but sometimes we sing songs that we don't really even believe. Romans 8, 11 says, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me. What kind of power is that? And we're sitting there struggling to get, get up on a Monday morning and go to work. We're, we're weak and, and we're struggling against, and fighting against this sin that so easily entangles us. We're all the time just too weak to say, actually, I'm sorry. All the while, we got this deep riches of the glory of God that's on the inside of us, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, and we're struggling to do some of the weakest and, and really the most uh, basic things. Church, you are powerful. Awaken to your identity. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit, the glory of God that broke rocks because it left the temple and left Jesus, if you will. It's that same glory that enters into you when you say, Christ, come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. And if you've never made that decision, you're watching right now, we're going to give you a moment uh, here at the end of the service and at the end of this message. But if you have had that moment, I remember when I led my UPS driver to Jesus on the truck, it was after a long day of delivering packages, you know, in the Christmas season, right after we got home from Brazil, I was working there temporarily and we were on the truck and he finally said, I want to, I want Jesus to be my Lord and savior. And he prayed the prayer and all of a sudden he says, man, what's going on? I feel like this truck is shaking. It's like, come on, somebody, the glory of God, man, he's coming in. He's, he's come to inhabit you, that same glory that was there in the Old Testament that rested on the tabernacle, that same glory that even was in Jesus now is in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Man, I'm excited about this message, man, because when I feel weak, I remind myself, no, that's just your feelings. I'm actually really powerful. <laughs> Have any of you guys seen the Raiders of the Lost Ark? Indiana Jones. I love Indiana Jones, man. Like that was like Hollywood's best for me. Like I felt like when, when Hollywood was making Indiana Jones and, you know, those original Star Wars and things like that, that was like, I think quintessential Hollywood, like that was like, that's the type of movie I want to see. They kind of started getting there a little bit with the national treasure. I kind of like that, but like Indiana Jones, the Raiders of the Lost Ark, man, such an awesome movie. At the end of the movie though, spoiler alert, they end up going, kind of like the excavator that I was talking about in the beginning of this message. They're, they're going and they're uh, digging up, trying to find, and the Nazis were involved now, the bad guys, and you know. And, and so they're, they're digging up and they finally find the Ark of the Covenant, the place, again, of the Holy of Holies where the glory of God dwell. And then all of a sudden, man, this glory cloud comes and poof, you know, the, the glory pops out of the ark and all the Nazis burn up and they like melt and you see their skeletons and like, ah! And Indiana Jones, like he's holy, so I guess he's separated from this and he's just closing his eyes. We're not looking, we're not looking, right? Now, I know that that's Hollywood, but I want you to recognize, man, that's the type of glory though that's on the inside of you. Do you remember what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration? where Peter and James and John were with Jesus. And then all of a sudden came Moses and Elijah. And it was like the Bible says Jesus' brilliance just began to shine. What was on the inside of him began to shine on the outside of him. And they beheld his glory. 
the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. When we get born again, that same glory enters into us so that when we really discover it and we dig up those riches, people will now behold us and say, man, there's something different about that guy. There's something different about that girl. Something is there I, I, that I've been looking for and, and wanting my whole entire life. You begin to manifest on the outside who you really are on the inside. And let me tell you something. It is powerful. It is powerful. This is what changes everything. The Old Testament said, not by might, not by my power, but by your Holy Spirit, oh God, by the power of your spirit. The more we discover our identity, the more we ask God to open our eyes to this. And I'm praying through this whole series that you will say, open my eyes, God, help me understand this. When that thing hits you, more of that revelation, you, you, you behold his glory in you, you behold his glory in the scripture, you behold his glory because you get to know him better. Now you are transformed by that same glory to glory to glory to the point where now you'll be like Moses coming down from the mountain. You'll be like, you know, Peter, James, and John and Jesus after that mountain of transfiguration and the world will behold what's inside of you. It is the temple of the Holy Spirit because you house the presence of God. Come on, are you with me today, church? Come on, give somebody, give some praise to our almighty God, man. That's some amazing stuff. So the next time you're feeling weak or tired or even weary, and I can't do what's on my to-do list, I, I can't, I, I don't even know if I can keep on keeping on, I want you to remember your identity. You're powerful because you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are holy. You are set apart. You're not who you used to be. Live in and dwell in that new identity. Why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes with me today? Thanks for joining us for worship today. I'm John Collier, and I hope today has inspired you to love God and to love others more. We always wanna take some time at the end to pray for you, especially if this is the first time of believing that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Father, forgive us of our sins. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross and raise again so that he can be king and we don't have to be. Help us to learn more about you so we can live more like you. <laughs> we want you to connect with us and we want to connect with you. You can comment down below or go to diversitychurch.net and we'll see you again next week.